morning, friends. Welcome to worship. It's so good to be together, uh, to worship the one true and living God. And we do that together, even though many of us are scattered um, in our homes. Some of us are scattered across the country. And yet together with the united hearts, we worship our one true and living God. This morning, um, I was reminded of how busy I often am running and going and doing and how on this Lord's Day we are invited to settle in and to rest in Him, to allow Him to be God and for us to trust that He will work out the things that He says He's going to. In that vein, I have a poem I'd like to read to you. Um, the author is Helen Frazee Bauer and the title is I Rest in His Love. I rest in his love as a ship in a storm takes rest on a restless sea, knowing the currents that bear it up are steady and strong and free. I rest in his love as a tree in the wind takes rest through the bitter blast, feeling the pull of the deep, deep roots that anchor it sure and fast. I rest in his love as a babe on the chest takes rest from the world's alarms, hearing the beat of a parent heart locked close in the parent arms. I rest in his love, he will bear me up, and anchored my soul shall be. As a storm-swept ship, as a sleeping child, I rest as a wind-tossed tree. I invite you today to rest in his love, to settle in and experience him in a new way today. Hi friends, always good to be with you. I want to read from Psalm 89 today. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. So I invite you to join me from home as we sing to our King together. We're going to start by singing a song called Sing to the King. sing a hymn called Rejoice, the Lord is King. If you are using a hymnal, it's number 228.
pray together today, we join in prayer for ourselves and for our world. We pray for those who are followers of Jesus, those who are running from him, and for those who aren't even aware that he exists. The days of COVID continue to stress the fabric of our society in various ways, so we pray for the followers of Jesus to continue to be a shining light of hope in a world of darkness and fear. We pray for those who are captured by fear to be released so that they can live the life of peace and joy that God desires for them to live. And we give God praise for he is still in control and he is still calling all people to live for him, no matter how difficult the circumstances. He's calling all of us to live for him because he wants us to experience his best in this life and in the next. As we pray today, consider taking time to pray for yourself as well. I invite you to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, the days of COVID are getting long. The chaos it has caused isn't subsiding. The depression is becoming more real. Friendships are getting stretched, and we need your help. We want to do what is good and right. We want to love as you love. We want to place our faith fully in you. But just like Peter, it's hard to keep our eyes off the choppy waves of the sea around us. Help us to lock our eyes on you. Help our unbelief. Help us remain faithful in our words, our actions, our reactions, and our attitudes. Help us to be patient with others as you have been patient with us. Thank you for your compassion and patience. Thank you for never getting tired of hearing us vent our frustrations. Thank you for continuing to work with us to show us the right way to live. Your way is not always easy, but it is always good. And deep down inside, we want to follow it. We really know that it is the only way. So as we pray together today, we ask you to illumine our eyes to see as you see. Give us ears to hear your voice and the cry of our brothers and sisters and the cry of the lost. Give us hearts that beat and break as yours beats and breaks for the world. Give us the will to follow you no matter the cost. Give us your joy so that in every situation we can rejoice and bring honor to you. So fill us with your presence, 
your wisdom, and your peace, that we are accused of being Christ followers. Make us so like Jesus that that charge is something for which we are willing to die. As you are working to make us into the people you want us to be, you are also working to bring the lost into your kingdom. For that and so much more, we thank you and we praise you. We pray for those who don't know you. We pray for those who have walked away from you. And we pray for those who have become complacent in their relationship with you. Would you do what it takes to get their attention? Send your spirit to speak truth into their lives. Grant sight to their blinded eyes. Break the chains that have bound them and made them a slave of Satan. Thank you for never being too busy to hear about our daily problems. For some reason, the dogs who eat the crumbs from the rich man's table are the ones who seem to catch your attention. You never pass by the poor for the more affluent or the outcasts for the politically connected. You never pass by the well-to-do for the dedicated follower of Jesus. Your love for us never ceases to amaze us. It is with that knowledge that we bow humbly in your presence, seeking forgiveness, asking for healing, for comfort, and for wisdom. Your love for us is inconceivable. Your dedication to us is unwavering. Your desire for us to live well knows no limits. We offer ourselves completely to you. For Christ's sake, amen. Kids, this is your time. Uh, I have something here that I want to show you, and I hope that you can see it in the picture here. This is a little lamp that actually I bought in China uh, while we were there last year. And uh, it's very much like the lamps that were used in Bible times. Uh, of course, they didn't have electric lights, you know, and things like that. And so they used these little lamps. And you see there's a hole in the top. And they would take oil like this. And they would pour into the lamp. And then here at the end, you see, they have a wick. Just like a candle would have a wick. And they would light it. And that would give them lamp, light to see by. And they would hold it in the palm of their hands just like that so they could see where to go because uh, there were no street lights, you know, and things like that in those days. Um, I thought about this this week as I was thinking about there's a psalm in the book of Psalms, Psalm 119. Uh, where the psalmist, the writer says, God, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Uh, and he meant by that, that when we don't know what to do, when we wonder uh, whether we ought to make this decision or that decision, oftentimes, if we would go to God's word, uh, the Bible, we can find uh, wisdom there and we can find an answer to our questions. Uh, that we have. So he says, your word, God, is like a lamp to my feet. It shows me the way to go. It, it clarifies things and it brings light into my world. So I know where I'm walking so I don't trip and fall on something. If I listen to your word, then I'll be safe and I will do what you've asked me to do. So I hope you see God's word that way in your life, because there's a lot of things in our world that are trying to say to us every day, oh, listen to me, I know the way, I know the way, I know the way. Lots of things on the news, on the radio, on the internet, they say, well, listen to me, I'm a light, I can show you the way. Well, the psalmist found the one true way uh, to know what's really good and right and true is God's word. It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path to show us the way. Lord, would you help all of us to understand 
how important your word is uh, and uh, speak to us through it and help us to go to it. Go to your word when we're confused and we don't know what to do. May your word be to us. May we make it to us. A lamp to our feet and a light to our way. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to mention just a few quick words of announcement here. If you are watching this Worshiping With Us today through the video and you have not yet signed up for the church email chain, an email that comes from the church office just about daily, uh, highlighting the latest church news uh, announcements, schedule changes, different things. It also is the venue that Pastor Darrell uses to uh, send updates on Wednesdays and on Saturdays with links to worship services and other uh, special presentations. Uh, if you have not signed up for the E-Chain, please do that by emailing Renee or Patty at uh, the church office, office at wfmc.net. That is office at wfmc.net, and they will get you on that e chain. The worship services are produced and uh, published early every Sunday morning on both the uh, Wilmore Free Methodist Church YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. You can subscribe to those things as well, but just uh, search for Wilmore Free Methodist Church on YouTube or if you're a Facebook user on Facebook. Also, uh, wilmorefmc.org, that is uh, our church's website, that carries all of this information, uh, links to worship services and other uh, special productions. Um, again, wilmorefmc.org. You can also find on the church website the information about giving. Uh, please note that uh, there is a button on the home page of the church website uh, titled Give, and that gives all the information you need about how to give to the church uh, electronically. You can also always drop by offerings in the uh, church office, open daily Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Our uh, scripture text this morning is from, again, the book of Jude. Uh, I'd like to read just uh, four verses for us, actually verses four through eight, five verses. So uh, the book of Jude, uh, there's only one chapter, verses uh, four through eight. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago, Jude says, have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you know this already, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, those he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on that great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings." We've been looking at this uh, little often neglected and even more often misunderstood letter from Jude, the brother of James and the slave of Christ. That's how he refers to himself. We said last Sunday that he wrote this, this letter to a group of believers that he obviously cares about very much, but also we said that this was not his first choice of topic uh, to write to them. He intended to write something different, but he was compelled to change his trajectory, uh, what he was going to write, and warn them instead about an infestation that was in their midst and in their body. Uh, a person, uh, a man, presumably, or a group of them, Jude says, had slipped into their fellowship, wormed their way into this church body, 
and they were working toward influencing that body with untrue, unorthodox teachings that if they took hold there in that body, they were dangerous enough to ruin the salvation of those in that group. This was a life or death issue, actually an eternal life or eternal death issue that Jude is taking on here. That's how Jude saw this. Uh, now, last Sunday, we focused on the danger of the way that the falsehoods were being delivered into the church. It was not through some overt, you know, public proclamation. Those are too easy to see. Those are too easy to evaluate. What was going on instead was this slow, very sly process where the poison was being delivered a little bit at a time an infestation, you see, and that's the danger of infestations. They're, they're clandestine by their nature. They are covert operations that aren't even noticed until the damage is nearly already complete. Here's an example of what was going on. If I were to show you this, and you see this, and just if I were to make a statement, this vase is red. Everybody watching this, uh, everybody who could see, <laughs> who's not blind, would say, well, no, it isn't. It's, it's blue. And no matter how much I insisted, no matter how loud or indignant I got, you'd still say, you're nuts if you think that's red. <laughs> this is blue. But if I came to you one day and said, you know, I've been studying some things about color. Did you know that new studies are showing that the colors red and blue are really not self-differentiated primary colors? That, that microscopic elements of colorant are being found in each that suggest that there is a similarity between them. In fact, even a unity between those microscopic elements of red and blue that we've never realized before. Yeah, I've been studying that. It's very interesting. You should look into that. So, so then I walk away and I leave you to think about that. Then a couple weeks later, I come back around. I approach you very winsomely and talk this time about how the Finnish glaze has been proven to distort true color, which, which actually does have a, a bit of truth in it. Interestingly, uh, but then a week later, I could make a, a biological case for how different human eyes see color differently and, and how, of course, that would have to play a part in the debate about true color. And then, you know, a week or so later, I could make some sociological statement about how the color red has been unfairly demonized through the years. I mean, it's suffered all sorts of uncalled for marginalization and, and hatred, really. I, I feel bad for what people have done to the color red. It's terrible, really, what people have done and said about the color red. And then, you know, a week or two later, I could come back and make a philosophical case for what, what really is true color anyway. I mean, is it, is it perception? Is it science? Is it biology? Is it pigment? Is it the, uh, found on the macro level or the micro level? Is it opinion? Is it sociological? Uh, is it all of these things together? And see if they're all different for all different people, given all this, then, then is it really wrong for me to say that this vase is actually red? You see how that works? That's what an infestation, like Jude is speaking of here, does. It reveals itself little at a time. It makes you question even the validity of what can easily and obviously be seen. And it does that because it suggests that you're privileged to know things that others don't know, whether they're true or not. An infestation like Jude was dealing with plays on our pride. It plays on our arrogance because we like to think that we know things that other people don't. We like to think we're smarter and that we have special knowledge that other people 
don't have. That was the sin of Gnosticism. Gnosticism. The word is impressive, <laughs> but really what it is, it's just plain old pride. It's an intellectual pride that says, I'm better than others because I have special knowledge. That was what was happening in this church, and it was leading them into immoral behavior, immoral choices, immoral lifestyles. Someone or, or some people, some group of people, had wormed their way in, and through the infestation of their errant intellectual arguments, they were managing to disconnect relationship with Jesus, faith in Christ, from a true Christian lifestyle. That's what was happening. And they were doing it by redefining, or rather misdefining, grace. We said last week uh, the disconnection involved two tenets, and you can find them in verse 4 there. Uh, the first, Jude says, is that these infiltrators were changing the grace of God into a license for immorality. That is the key phrase in what was going on there. License for immorality. They were teaching and they were living that the grace of God allows for, and more than allows for, is a, is a license for immoral personal behavior. That is the heresy we mentioned last week of antinomianism. And that tries to say that the grace of God actually frees believers from the need to keep any kind of moral code or standard of behavior. Uh, you see, no matter what I do, whatever sin I may commit, God's grace is big enough to cover it. So I may as well do whatever I like, whatever feels good, whatever pleases me. I may as well give my body over to its basis lust. I may as well indulge in whatever behavior is most fun at the moment to me, regardless of earthly consequence, because God's grace is so big, it's so overwhelming, he will forgive me in the end and everything will turn out. Okay, that is the position of antinomianism. And although the name antinomianism for that particular heresy only came to be as recently as the 16th century, the tenets of it appear there in the book of Jude in the earliest of churches. And, and frankly, not only there in Jude, the apostle Paul speaks against the very same thing in Romans and in Ephesians. Peter speaks against it as well because it's an utter affront to the holy character of God, you see. To believe and to teach that sinning is fine because of the greatness of God's power to forgive is so immensely presumptuous, it's, it's hard to even describe. The very thought of it stands against the overwhelming message of the Bible that God calls people to be holy as he is holy and that God punishes wicked and sinful behavior. That is the reality and the message of Scripture. Uh, now, think about that a minute. I mean, any parent would bristle at the idea that their kid would think it fine to behave in exactly the opposite way that they taught him or her to behave, the opposite of what the parent thinks is good and right, to just give in to their lust without even a thought because they knew the parents' love for them would see past it in the end. That is the height of arrogance and presumption. But even more dangerous than that, it's blatant and intentional sin. Which moves toward the second declaration of Jude uh, against these infiltrators, uh, which is they were denying Jesus Christ as their only Lord. You see, in this very way, they determined that it was fine to simply ignore everything Jesus said, everything Jesus commanded regarding living a moral life, regarding personal holiness, and love and concern for the good of others. Now, I, I can't even begin to go through all the examples of that, that we, where we see that in Jesus. If you're curious, you know, the, the Sermon on the Mount is a great place to start to review just some of Jesus' words on those subjects. I will mention, though, Jesus' reminder in Matthew 5, where he introduces 
a whole section of teaching on moral behavior by saying this. He says, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them until heaven and earth disappear. Not the smallest letter will by any means disappear from the law. So anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do that too will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jude saw was going on there in that church, you see. And then just catch this last part of what Jesus says there in verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, which you see, it was all talk and no practice. That was the issue with the Pharisees and the teachers. They talked a big game, but they didn't live what they taught. Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses that, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why Jude wrote what he did. This is why it was to him a life or death situation for those believers to whom he wrote. You can't ignore God's call to holiness. You can't deny it. You can't neglect it. You can't dismiss it and presume that grace will cover you. It's an issue of intent, you see. It's an issue of intent. Now, of course, you can make mistakes in ignorance. I mean, we all do. And God is, is pleased to for, forgive those. He's pleased to forgive us when we're honestly pursuing him and his word and the life that he calls us to lead. When obedience is our intention, God is incredibly gracious and incredibly forgiving. But when our pursuit turns into presumption, when we intend to please ourselves, and not God, and then presume upon his grace and upon his forgiveness. That's when we get in trouble. That's what caused the Apostle Paul to ask the church at Rome, what are you saying? That we should go on sinning so that grace might increase? And then he answers himself. He says, no way. No way. You can't do that. Eventually, that attitude will end a relationship with God. Why, you ask? Well, not because it harms God's grace toward us, not because it diminishes God's love for us, not because it changes God's desire for us to walk with him. It will sooner or later end a relationship with God simply because there's no honesty left about it, about the relationship. The relationship has become all about us. You see, our way, our happiness, our satisfaction, our success, our taking advantage of God just so we get what we want from him. I mean, think about that in human terms. <laughs> have you ever tried to have a, a relationship, friendship, uh, are you dating, maybe you're married, <laughs> to somebody who is totally self-absorbed and self-focused. Have you ever tried to have a relationship with somebody like that? You, you can't do it, not in honesty, because the interaction is entirely one-sided. You, know, you, can, you can try for a time, but, but a self-absorbed person, I mean a totally self-absorbed person, doesn't care about anyone but self. And by definition, it's impossible for a person like that to be in a real, mutually giving, mutually interactive relationship. That's Jude's concern here. The error in thinking that is weaving its way through this church is leading to not only wrong conclusions about God's character, but also to wrong practice, wrong lifestyle based in self-satisfaction. And all of that, if left as it is, will eventually lead to death. You see, it's, it's not just academic. This is not just something of the mind. No, actually, nothing spiritual is merely something of the mind. It is practical, completely practical. How we believe and what we do in response to what we believe has to work together. That's praxis. <laughs> The consistency between what we think, what we believe, and what we do. 
And our praxis always carries eternal consequences. God takes sin very seriously. He does not ignore sinful behavior. God punishes sin. He always has. And you know that. That's what Jude is reminding his readers of. He says that plainly there in verse 5. And, and right here is where this book typically loses us. Because, I mean, let's face it. From now on, there's some pretty weird stuff in here, in this book of Jude, from our perspective anyway. Um, it looks weird to us because we're not first century Jews. So we don't naturally follow all three of these arguments that Jude makes here. Uh, but his original readers, of course, were first century Jews, and they would have followed him. In fact, the arguments Jude makes here would have been easily some of the most powerful arguments he could have possibly made to the original readers of this letter in conveying the point that God's character has not changed with the coming of Jesus and with the grace that he offers. God still takes sin very seriously, and so we need to take sin seriously. That is what Jude is trying to communicate. And he uses these illustrations uh, to do that. Now, the first one, the first illustration is probably the easiest for us. Uh, verse 5 there, the example of Israel's deliverance out of Egypt. Jude's point in bringing this up is to remind us that those who have been saved by grace can still be condemned if they are not faithful to God in an ongoing way. You see, God delivered his people out of Egypt. I mean, what greater act of deliverance and grace could Jude have possibly pointed to, to, to make this illustration? God delivered his people out of Egypt. In tremendous grace, God delivered them out of Egypt. Yet, even those who had been among that group, who had experienced firsthand the grace and the power of God, most of them were banished from the promised land. They were set to wander in the desert for 40 years and to die there. They never saw the promise fulfilled. Why? They disobeyed God's command to take the land. You see, even after all this grace that they had experienced, they failed to trust God. And not just that one time. I mean, they failed to trust him in that initial entry. You know, he said, go on in and take it. They said, oh, no, 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 no. Then again, they, they failed to trust him with the golden calf incident. And then in their constant murmuring, I wish we could go back. And then in their worship of Baal at Peor, uh, in committing immorality with the Moabite women, and, and just on and on it goes. Numbers 26 says, not one of them survived, but Caleb and Joshua. Why? Because they did not believe God and they rebelled against him. They rebelled against his way over and over and over again, even after experiencing his delivering grace. So Jude's message to his readers in this illustration is this, remember the Israelites of old. If you fall into the same sort of sin and rebellion as they did, the same sort of judgment will come on you. Remember, that even from the very gates of heaven, as John Bunyan wrote, there is still indeed a way to hell. That's his first illustration. Jude's second illustration, <laughs> that's the harder one for us, where he speaks in verse 6 about the angels who did not keep their possessions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, and so God is holding them in chains until the, the proper time, the judgment of their action. Now, we need to understand that the Jews had a very developed angelology, the, the study of angels. And that included, of course, the fall of the angels, which is talked about a lot in the book of Enoch. It's a, that's an ancient Hebrew apocalyptic work written uh, about 200 BC. Um, but it's also in the Bible. Both, both Isaiah and Ezekiel mention this fall of the angels, and they say that it was the result of pride and rebellion within the ranks of the angels. In fact, that's how we're introduced to Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14. Um, it appears in the New Testament too. Jesus talks about Satan falling like lightning from heaven in the context of the disciples' ministry success. And there's some debate about exactly what that means and why he brings it up there. But it was a reality to Jesus. 
There's also uh, another reference, though, to, to fallen angels, and you find that in Genesis 6, where we're told that angels were attracted to the beauty of the daughters of the humans, and so they left heaven for the sake of their lust, and they wound up creating these people called the Nephilim, the, the superhuman heroes of old. Uh, you see, in their doing this, the angels were out of God's order. They left their own place, and they insisted upon taking what was not theirs to take. They insisted upon becoming what was not theirs to become. Uh, so, so what Jude does here is, in effect, uh, combine these two events in order to communicate that the sins of lust and prideful rebellion have the capacity to take down even angels. Even those who enjoy the, the highest heights of spiritual attainment are not guaranteed ultimate victory. When, when rebellion and pride and lust are concerned, when you take those things together, there is no place of arrival from which a person cannot fall. So, so how is salvation secured? Well, Jude would say only by keeping faith current and true, contending for, you see, fighting for, staying engaged and active and obedient in the faith in a consistent and persistent way. That is what results in salvation. Apart from that, Jude says, remember the angels and know that if you fall into that same sort of sin, and rebellion, the same sort of judgment will come to you. That's his second argument. Then uh, third, last example Jude gives in verse 7. And that's a familiar one to us. The, the account of, of Sodom and Gomorrah from Genesis 19. Sodom and Gomorrah, above every other account in Scripture, would have been seen by Jude's readers, and frankly by by followers of God in nearly all times and places as the foremost example of the sin of humanity and the judgment of God coming together. Um, what happened in those cities is referenced in Deuteronomy, Amos, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zephaniah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Matthew, Luke, Romans, 2 Peter, and revelation. Their story is flung all through the Bible. It's spoken of by Jesus himself. And although the, the sins of those cities do include immorality in a general sense and certainly uh, an abuse of, of hospitality, uh, in spite of what a growing number of people, both inside and outside the church, want to believe today, and what our culture is believing today more and more readily, the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah also obviously include the acting out of homosexual lusts and desires and the threat to do those things even against angels of all people, God's very representatives. That was particularly horrendous. What it said about them was that the people in those cities had no regard for God. They had no regard for his way. They had no regard for his order. They had no regard for his people, his representatives. Those cities were in utter rebellion against God. And in return for their rebellion, they were consumed off the face of the earth. So, Jude says, remember Sodom and Gomorrah. And know that if you fall into that same sort of sin and rebellion, the same sort of judgment will come to you. By taking all, then, of these arguments together, we can come up with a pretty clear picture of what was being taught in this, this church. Why Jude was concerned. The, the sins the heretics were encouraging, the sins they insisted grace would cover, involved immorality, 
bodily sexual immorality of the most blatant kinds. They were saying it's fine to participate in this because God's grace will cover us in the end. In Jude's estimation, that is essentially creating a new religion because none of those things in his mind could be in any way compatible with Christianity. They were trying to create a new religion that would bring together these Christian ideas and a totally morally pagan lifestyle. And that can never work, Jude says. It's a false notion. It's been tried before. Rebelling against God's ways, against his word, presuming upon his grace, it's been tried before. And it always results in a mess, in condemnation, and apart from any sort of true repentance and turning from that sin, it results ultimately in judgment and destruction. This is what was of life and death to Jude, you see. His argument, his plea here is, don't give in to an idea that has proven all through history to result in both temporal and eternal destruction. As is so often the case, people do stupid things because they're either ignorant of history or because in their pride, they refuse to learn from history, from what has happened before. Jude is appealing to the very history of God with his people the history of God with his creation to the history of God's character and the history of God's order, how God has ordered things in this world. Jude's appealing to all of these things to say to those who are under the influence of these invaders, toying with heresy-based sexual immorality. Jude is saying to them, don't do it. Don't give into it. Don't imagine God approves of it. Don't believe that grace, apart from repentance, will cover it. It's never been that way. It's never been that way. And it's not that way with God now. That's what Jude was trying to say. There are always people. There are always people today. There have always been people who, who lobby for new freedom, new morality, with regard to marriage and divorce, with regard to sexual sins, with regard to uh, what you ingest into your mind <laughs> or into your body. Uh, there's always people that are saying, oh, well, this, it's, it's our day. This is a new day. And so these things should all be okay. But you know, none of it is really new. It's just the old immorality seeking to justify itself by pretentious phrases or insidious infestations by worming in to try to change something God has said, something about the way God has ordered our world to change it and to make it more suitable for them. Every time you turn around throughout history and certainly today, someone is trying to make a new normal the normal, particularly with regard to morality and particularly with regard to sexual morality. But you see, it was happening there in Jude's day, in the first century. And Jude doesn't buy it. And he says very plainly, neither should we. Don't give in to the infestations of misdefined grace, of meaningless faith, and of the self-satisfying immorality of our age. Just, just as it always has, our very eternity depends on what we do with this. It depends on our praxis, how we think about grace, and then how we live it out in our decisions day by day. So don't be deceived. God holds out the way. He always has held out the way. Ours today and has always been to follow him in that way. That is the way of salvation. And that is the way of grace, according to Jude. Would you pray with me? 
Lord, would you help us to do just that, to, to follow you and follow your way. It may mean that we walk completely against our culture with regard to morality. It may mean that we appear to be backward or prudish or unenlightened, unsophisticated. But would you help us to recognize those infestations when we see them? Those subtle ways that people try to say, well, maybe this, or maybe that, or maybe this. Help us to always be able to see things for what they really are. What you say clearly and plainly that they are. And would you help us to follow in that line of history that chooses to believe you and trust you, come what may. Lord, for any, even today, that are listening, that have given in to an infestation, these subtle ideas that say, well, maybe this isn't really what God says. Maybe this isn't really what God means. Maybe this isn't really what God intends. Lord, would you help them to see, through the witness of history, through the words of Jude, the danger they're in. And would you help them turn and follow you, or maybe follow you once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to respond by singing Be Thou My Vision. It's number 382 in your hymnal if you're using one. is increasingly confused about truth, about right and wrong, about moral and immoral behavior. May we always be people of light, not judgmental, not argumentative, not harsh, but may we be warm and winsome and attractive examples of how God created people to live, how God intended relationships to work. So the world around might see God and His way in us. And so it might find not just hope for good today, but hope for salvation, for a good eternity. 
The Lord bless and keep you. Thank you for worshiping with us today.